everyone uh, let's uh, let's get started um first i want to talk a little bit about midterm exam because i've started to receive some uh, questions about it first uh, a reminder that uh, you have two components of your final grade which were which is going to be your homework assignments and your uh, exams and your exams make 30 percent of your total grade uh, midterm and the final are um yeah measured equally um i last last year i noticed that sometimes it's hard to know what your grade is because canvas won't show you the uh the grade um you know if you had 100 percent in the upcoming assignments maybe you wonder what your grade is going to be so if if you want to do that for yourself just um you uh, measure your total score by taking a uh, 70% of your current average in your homework plus 30% of your average exam. And that gives you the score, which you can then map into a grade uh, with the standard, you know, uh, mapping that the University of Utah is using. And then, I mean, um, if you want, you can tweak what your average is going to be uh, if you had, you know, certain scores in the upcoming homework. But going back to the midterm exam, it's going to be almost all multiple choice question answering, except uh, one one question, which will be free form. And it will, uh, this question will be about um, checking whether you can specify a neural network. Similarly, like I did it on the whiteboard when I wrote a sequence of uh, equations. So I'll be checking that you can do that yourself, but everything else is going to be multiple choice questions. And they are going to be, um, if you have come be coming here at this lecture, I suspect you will be all uh, successful at answering these questions. They are going to be just about the content in the lecture. So I'm using slides, just slides, no, no extra reading, no nothing additional to make these questions. They aren't going to be uh, of a type what is uh, define, define something. You will need to think about concepts, think a little bit about what the consequence of a certain uh, concept is. So when you're reviewing your slides, don't just try to memorize, aha, uh -huh, this is by Perry Coder, and rather try to memorize, not memorize, but think about what the, why did we introduce by pair encoding? What does it do? Uh, and what are the consequences of that? A little tricky part is going to be that there will be multiple possible answers, and I won't tell you how many there are. And the way uh, I am going to grade the questions is that there will be four, let's say if there are four uh, options that I offer, um, each one of them can bring you one over four points. Um, one, because the entire question can give you one point, and there are four options there for one over four. And basically for each one of them, I'm checking binary, whether you have selected or not selected this choice, uh, depending on what was the right decision. So maybe let's go over this example. Um, if I ask you to select the advantages of by pair encoding, and let me um, fix this to make our, okay, let's have it like this. Okay, so for example, one question in the last year's midterm was uh, select the advantages of by pair encoding. And the following, uh, there are following options. One, uh, it eliminates the need for out of vocabulary tokens. It strictly adheres to the distributional hypothesis. It uses fixed size embeddings for all tokens. And four, it finds a vocabulary size on its own based on a given corpus. Um, okay, now, um, what are the, what is the correct or more correct uh, answers here? Let's go one by one. Uh, does BPE eliminate the need for out of vocabulary tokens? If you know the answer or wish to make a guess, please raise your hand. Oh, sorry. He was uh, the first, yeah. Uh, that's not maybe. It does not eliminate uh, the need. Actually, it eliminates the need for out of vocabulary tokens. Remember, the BPE splits everything in these sub tokens. So every word now can be decomposed into subword units. And if we don't have uh, subword units that compose this uh, word, then we do so called character fallout, where we just compose the word from the uh, characters. So we no longer need to introduce this special unknown. Um, 
unknown um, the tokens and add them to the vocabulary. So one of the advantages of VP is that we no longer need to introduce special unknown token and then at the test time represent unknown words with unknown tokens. Okay, that's, uh, let's talk about the next one. It strictly adheres to the distributional hypothesis. Can someone tell what the distributional hypothesis is? Do you remember vaguely? Okay, you, you tried one, so I'll see whether someone else uh, can, can help us with this one. Um, when, when did we introduce the distributional hypothesis? I guess. Yes. Um, so we introduced it, yes, when we talked about semantics. Um, it didn't say that certain oh, words is. Yes. That even though words appear in the are complex. Exactly. So the, this, that's exactly what the distributional hypothesis says. And then we said, okay, we are going to embrace this to develop our word. Uh, vector space where words that appear in similar context appear similar in this vector space. Okay, now the question is, BPE strictly adheres to the distributional hypothesis. What is BPE? Yeah. Um, it's a way of creating a whole vocabulary. Mm -hmm. And then basically breaking down sentences into the tokens in this vocabulary. So does BPE has anything to do with distributional hypothesis? No, right? I see some people shaking heads, but this is an example of a choice that has nothing to do with the, you know, the question asked. And here you should not select it because you should understand that these are two completely uh, irrelevant, you know, orthogonal concepts. Okay. It uses fixed size embeddings for all tokens. We have just rem like now reminded ourselves what the BPE does. Now you should immediately know whether this is true or false. You're saying false. Can you say a little bit why? Yeah, it, uh, exactly. So we are checking how many times adjacent tokens appear next to each other. Uh, embeddings are never used for tokenization. Tokenization and embeddings, again, two separate concepts. So here you should not select this choice. Okay, and then finally it finds a vocabulary size on its own based on a given corpus. Right? Oh, you were nodding, so I was like... Yeah, I was going to say true. True? Can you say why you think it's true? Because it takes the vocabulary from it. Okay, so yeah, um, one one important distinction. So when we are doing uh, splitting the words into the tokens, we call this tokenization. And this is, uh, we are not creating vocabulary for each individual instance. I've been noticing uh, this in the office hours that uh, it seems like uh, because I think in your homework, you were developing counters for each individual instance. So now it seems like you started to think as if, as if there is a vocabulary for each individual instance. That's not the case. We have one shared vocabulary, right? And given tokens that are in the vocabulary, we make the tokenization process that splits a given string into the uh, tokens. Um, so yeah, the, the, uh, but you, you were right when you said that how this is done is basically learned from the data. Uh, so it is true that BPE tokenizers learns the vocabulary from the data and learns the merging rules that are later used to split the string into the tokens. But did we set a certain hyperparameter? And did this hyperparameter have anything to do with the vocabulary size? Uh, yes, but how exactly? What are we setting? You want to try? 
Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So we are we we have set the hyperparameter number of merges, and then we were looping over the number of you know just reaching the um number of um excuse me merges, and we stop there. And depending on that number plus the size of the initial um vocabulary, which were all the characters in the alphabet, this is how we had the final vocabulary size. So this is a little bit of a trick question. BP does learn uh, the vocabulary and it does learn the merging rules, but it doesn't learn the vocabulary size. And I said, this is one of the open research questions because it's going to, now we've started to talk about language models where we now know that the output layer is determined by the vocabulary size. And our output layer is a matrix of the hidden size times the uh, uh, vocabulary size. Now we know that these things become important. The voc vocabulary size can't be arbitrarily large. Um, okay, so this is an example of a question in um, in your midterm. It is, as you can see, I don't ask you, select, uh, what, what is BPE? Select tokenization, vector space, or, you know, that's that would be way easier. Here, you do need to understand this concept and you need to have a certain level of confidence, right? Like, um, you should be knowing that, okay, if this concept and these concepts are separate from each other, this is just a irrelevant option that I'm giving you. So be cautious of that. You need to learn things, you need to reason about them, but you also need to have a certain level of confidence when you uh, think about them. Okay. Um, and now going back to how the grading works, as you can see for each one of these, we had select or do not select. So basically depending on what you have done, I'm either giving you zero or uh, 0.25 points. And then we sum those and we give you uh, the total score for this question, which can be anything from zero to one. Um, okay. Today I felt, um, I'm not in a bad mood, but I decided to say in just a moment, no notes, but now seeing how um, that you weren't so quick with this question, I will rethink whether um, I will allow you to bring a sheet with open notes. So next time I will make a decision. Yes, please. So to give the points for, I mean, for the question for select and for the false instead of the plot, we have to use the Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So. Here, um, you should have selected one, not selected two, not selected um, three, and you shouldn't have selected four, right? And if you have done that, you get uh, one, but if you, for example, selected one and two, uh, then you get 0.75 because you lost uh, 0.25 here, yeah. Okay, um, so I will, I will, delete this and then make a decision next time. Um, you will need to bring your ID to the exam and this could be uh, any any kind of ID with your uh, photo on it where we can check your name and your face. Uh, so it can be your state ID, driver's license, passport or the university uh, ID. Um, unfortunately, I don't have practice exam for you because honestly, making one of these questions takes a lot of my time and I can barely make one exam with all of this, uh, but this is an example. So hopefully this uh, helps you. And again, everything that comes up to the midterm will be uh, potentially included in the midterm. You do need to only follow the slides and have recordings where you can kind of remind yourself the things I was saying. I do share extra readings, but I do not use those extra readings to make the exams. Okay. All right. So that's about the exam. I'm sure you will have more questions as we go along, but we have more than two weeks until the exam. There will be a midterm overview lecture where I will go over some important content. I mean, important concepts. Just to give a kind of a quick overview of the first half of this uh, course. It is not a replacement for the midterm, so don't rely just, uh, just on it. Okay, so um, let's move on uh, with our course uh, content. So, excuse me. Uh, last time we, uh, we started to, I started to introduce the task of language modeling, and the goal was to 
um, kind of set the ground for what will be large language models. As I said, it's already there in the name, obviously uh, it's going to be important. Uh, and specifically, we didn't talk about this yet in detail, we will come to this, but it's going to be the task we use for pre-training language models, meaning we are going to train language models, neural networks with the task of language modeling. And this will then serve as a basically model that we are all going to reuse for different purposes. We are going to continue training from those weights find through the language modeling task rather than uh, random weights. Uh, and we start with uh, neural language modeling. And uh, here I want to go into this a little bit more carefully and slowly. So again, the goal was to estimate the probability distribution over the vocabulary giving some preceding tokens. And the reason why we wanted to do that was because if we can have a probability distribution of our vocabulary, then we can predict what the next token could be. We predict some of the probable tokens in our distribution. And this is basically text generation. And you are all now aware of how powerful text generation can be given that you will have explored ChatGPT, which is literally a text generation system. Uh, it also allows us to estimate the probability of the sequences. If we know what the probability distribution over the vocabulary is at a given point, uh, we can then, uh, using the chain rule, multiply the conditional probability and get the joint probability of a sequence, which can serve different purposes. As I mentioned, for example, you can check um, if you have two sentences and you want to know which one is more grammatical, maybe the one that's more likely under this language model could be your uh, choice. How we, did we try to do that last time? We started with Engram language modeling, where we started with this huge corpus of, let's say, all Wikipedia texts. And then we basically count how many times certain uh, engrams occur um, relative to something else. And uh, this helped us build these conditional probabilities and through, again, chain rule, get the joint probability of a sequence. And then I showed you examples where I said, well, sometimes you really need a really large size of the engram, such as six gram, to be able to model something. Uh, and at the same time, that introduces issues like having very small probabilities, which then leads to, due to multiplying conditional probabilities to well, very small uh, probabilities of the overall sequence. Um, we did use smoothing to circumvent the problem of um, having zero probabilities, but we can still have the issue of very small probabilities. And uh, basically the, the issue here is the larger the n in is, the larger this context is, uh, the less likely is that we are going to occur such large engrams in our corpora. So that's the main issue with engram language modeling. And then we started to talk about neural language modeling, which I will now kind of uh, reintroduce with uh, more precise uh, equations. Um, just a recap, I said, we can maybe try to, to approach this using feed for our neural networks. Um, I will mention now more concretely why this could be problematic. And then I introduced recurrent neural uh, models. And then very soon we are going to switch with transformer language models, which are still the basis of pre-trained uh, language models today. So does anyone know what GPT stands for? Can you? I don't, I don't think so, but now I'm also not sure. sure. No. Yeah, pre-trained transformer for sure, but now I, 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 I thought um, it's actually general purpose. GPT, let's see. Generative pre-trained transformer. Okay, yeah. So um, I'm mentioning this just because it is one of these uh, language models um, and it's going to be transformer based. So you can see that transformer language modeling is basically basically GPT uh, of, of today. Okay, but let me switch to iPad and let's, uh, let's work through these uh, various neural language models um, a little bit more carefully than what I tried last time. 
I kind of wanted to avoid talking too much about it because we are going to go into details of transformer language modeling. We are going to have two entire lectures dedicated to it. So I was like, okay, it doesn't even matter, but I think it's it's nice to actually see uh, these other, other variants. So for the feed forward, let me know if this is um, too small for you. I will use NLM to denote neural language model. So this is this the 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 fate of these kinds of language model was really short. It was just the uh, after the free train word embeddings word vec was released, and next idea was to produce one of these language models. And there was a really short period of maybe a year where this idea floated around. So it's not super important for you to know this in a terms of practice, but maybe it's a good exercise to think, okay, how would I extend the uh, feed forward neural networks that we now, I hope, know better for sentiment classification, how we can approach it for predicting the next word. And for example, what Benji et al. did in 2015 was to define um, a context window. Um, one thing uh, that's always going to uh, happen is that you start with um, corpus, right? A collection of text, which is not labeled, it's not human annotated, just a scrape of the web or Wikipedia or whatever. So you start with that corpus and somehow you chunk it into pieces of text, but that's all you do. You don't have now a label of that chunk of text like you did with sentiment classification where some human told you this is positive or negative. So here you have corpus and then you have, um, you know, it, it's already a collection of text, so I won't do anything with it. And with uh, neural language modeling, you're gonna take one of these uh, texts and you are going to try to predict the next uh, word. So let's say we are uh, at the position, let's say um, we have this sentence in our corpus. Students are going to learn blah, blah, blah. Okay, let's say we scrape the web and in someone's course description, there is this uh, sentence students are going to uh, learn. Sorry, this is together. Okay, so what we do is um, when we train these neural language models, we are um, at the, let's say, position over here. Excuse me. We pretend we have seen uh, this, and now we want to predict what the next word is going to be. So we are basically pretending this part, we pretend we don't know it. Okay, so your question now is what you're trying to model is given given history, given these first uh, uh, three tokens students are going, you're trying to predict what the next word is. So you're trying to build a probability distribution over your vocabulary uh, and pick one of the most prob one of the probable tokens. So I should have adhered corpus plus. Uh, vocabulary. So imagine you start with um, you start with the corpus. You use your BP tokenizer to learn a vocabulary. Now you have vocabulary, which is again just a set of unique tokens that are learned from the data with their corresponding index. Okay, so one way to approach this uh, idea of predicting what the next word is going to be with feed forward neural network is to say. Well, similar to uh, applying Markov assumption in the case of Engram language models, here we are also going to assume we just need to look at the three previous uh, tokens. So we set our context to be three tokens long, and we need to represent it somehow. So we have learned that we can represent each one of these with the corresponding uh, embedding. This is gonna be word one, word two, word three, and so on. So we use, let's say, maybe to make it a little bit closer to what you know, I will write word to vec of word one and word to vec of word two, word to vec of word three. So um, 
yeah, this is basically what you're doing in your homework. Each one of these is going to be uh, D1 dimensional. We now know that D1 could be 50 or 300 uh, dimensions a lot. Okay, so we do that uh, thing first. And then because we have decided that we are going to always look at only three previous words or tokens, uh, so the context we are uh, looking at is going to be fixed, then, um, then uh, we can, for example, concatenate these to get the joint representation of the context. So I will call this um, hidden or context. It's going to be virtuvec of W1. This operation usually means concat. Virtuvec of W2. All right, so what is the size of this one? Quickly. Yes. Sorry, second. Uh, yes, oh, this, this vector that I just defined. One? 3D1. 3D1. Okay. Um, can you explain for your peers why 3D1? Because it's a uh, Okay. So if you are if you forgot what concatenating means, it just means prepending these to uh, appending these tokens one uh, after the other. Okay, great. So uh, reminder, our goal is to look, to predict the probability distribution over the uh, vocabulary. And I told you right now that we are going to do it with people in neural network, which you all are experts uh, at right now. So who will tell me what the next sequence of operation is going to be? I am interested in the one layer feed, one, one layer feed over neural network. Okay, let's let's have one hand raised. I wish to see someone who didn't speak much yet. Let's let's go. All right, what's the next thing? This is after recording again. Okay. Sorry, second. Well, we won't play this context by um, bits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the first thing is going to be define weights. Uh, give me some sizes for this. Uh, we skipped the, uh, one step. So we are doing hidden neural network, right? So in right now, we introduced uh, just the output layer. But we didn't transform this, right? So we first need to do what kind of transformation of our representation. Remember what was the motivation for neural networks when I switched from logistic regression into the neural network? What was the thing I started with? Nonlinearity, right? So we are going to apply nonlinearity, but first we need to do linear transformation, right? So we linearly transform, then we apply the nonlinearity. So the first thing is going to be linear transformation, and therefore this can be of the size D2, and then this has to be 3D1. How did I call these? What, what was the name for this one, 3D1? How did I call it when I was writing it here on the whiteboard? input dimension, right? And then this one, hidden dimension or output dimension, yeah. So we are first gonna do linear transformation, then apply nonlinearity, for example, ReLU, and I'm going to do this um, with the, um, so I'm going to call this hidden representation H tilde of context. It's gonna be ReLU with, um, V times H context. What's the dimension of this? Yep, D2. Okay, so our linear transformation transforms an input dimensional space 
into output dimensional space. Each one of these vectors is going to be uh, now a vector of size D2. Relu doesn't change dimension, it's applied dimension wise. Okay, so now we have our hidden representation and now we do what you mentioned, which is our output layer. Now we are doing the um, making probability distribution over uh, the, excuse me, um, vocabulary. So you mentioned we need a weight, right? Uh, this is a new weight matrix of which size is going to be. You were on. This one will be the size of the vector. Yes, that's right. So the next operation we do is uh, get the logits, which is going to be <clears throat> W O times H tilde context, and this is of which size? Vocabulary. Okay, are we done? No, we are not done. What's the next operation? Softmax, okay. Next thing is our actual probability over the vocabulary. I will call it PV, which is softmax of logit. <clears throat> what is the size of this one? I'm going to look over there a little bit. What's the size of, of uh, softmax applied to logics? Size. size of the vocabulary, right? Like softmax doesn't mean change that we give it a vector of certain size and spits out the vector of the same size, but with sposh uh, values. Okay, so now I keep telling I want a probability distribution. Well, we got our probability distribution, which is great. So now we have it, and uh, here each value in this vector is associated with a token and a vocabulary. And next thing is to pick one of them. And the easiest thing we can do is to pick the highest, the, the one which has the highest probability. And uh, say this is going to be the next uh, token to predict. Um, Today or next time, we are going to learn, this is called decoding strategy, how you go from this probability distribution over the vector and actually produce a token that's then visible by your eyes. What I just mentioned, predicting the highest probable one, is called greedy decoding, and it has issues. It's a, it's reasonable, but uh, it's not the best thing to do. Yes? So this vector that we get is mm -hmm. that the predicted one? No, so this is, uh, what, what is softmax? Remember, softmax is just a function that takes a high dimensional vector and outputs also a high dimensional vector of the same size, but each value is now squished to be between zero and one. And when we sum all the values in this vector, we get one. So in some sense, we get the notion of probability distribution. So this is gonna be vector. And now from this vector, you have to do what I just mentioned, and that's, uh, decoding um, decoding strategy. We are going to see a couple of this coding strategy probably next time. I, I put it at the end of today's lecture, but I can see I'm taking a really slow time with this. Um, so you do decoding to get the actual word. And so next token could be um, argmax in PW over your vocabulary. Again, this is greedy decoding, and it's not always the best choice to do. It is the most obvious thing to do, okay? All right, so this is an example of a free form question I will ask you in midterm to kind of specify these equations. Yes, please. So uh, in the last step, you're doing soft back. Uh, in this case, the vector is the size of the vocab because mm -hmm. you're predicting any word vocab. Yes. And so, but really that would depend on like your output space. So like for multi-class classification that'd be in that class you have, right? Uh, so our number of classes here is the number of tokens in the vocabulary. Right. If you are making an analogy with the classification. And in the case, uh, we are never assuming that our multiple words are probable, although that's wrong in, you know, in, in um, it is true that multiple tokens are possible, 
but the way we are always going to approach this as if there is one token that is true and others are not. And that's always for the training purposes going to be the whatever token actually appears next in your training data. So it's not perfect. And then when we do these decoding strategies, which go beyond just predicting the next, you know, the highest probable one is going to become important uh, because you do want some diversity. Okay, that's a good question. Um, we did this only to predict what will happen in the next uh, word, uh, but you would need to repeat this, uh, you know, through entirety of your uh, sequence during the training. During the test time, you cannot assume you ever have access to what comes next. So you start with your first word, and from this process, you get the next word. And then you're gonna put that word at the second position and repeat this process. And I'll come to this difference between when we are using what's in the data and we what we use uh, when we generate. Um, just uh, quickly over, let's go over the recurrent neural networks. So the issue with uh, with feed forward neural language models is that you are again doomed uh, with this you know fixed uh, size. And you could hypothetically say, well, uh, what if I have the arbitrarily long uh, long sequence? You know, I, I like this to be 20, uh, 20 you know uh, words in my uh, context and. Then the issue here becomes that when you are concatenating, you get a uh, 20 times d one dimensional uh, vector, which is becoming a pretty substantial vector. Uh, we can do these other operations we have learned, like averaging. But remember when I showed you the cases where the word order is no longer preserved, and for language modeling, especially word order is important. You must know what is the you know, previous words to kind of have a sense of what the next one would be. If you just scramble these, that's going to be uh, lost. So you want to do something better. And the next thing that was uh, really, you know, uh, popular is to use uh, these uh, recurrent neural networks or RNNs or their fancier versions, which are LSTMs. Just to briefly, how, what, what would change here? Let me use the same example. You, you again start with your, you know, corpus and vocabulary. Um, we will talk about evaluation of the uh, language models. I should have mentioned even on a previous slide that you split this into train and test because you are gonna use train data to learn this, you know, probability distribution. And then you are going to take your trained language model and test it on the test data uh, in your corpus. Okay, and now uh, let's see how LSTMs would do this. Students are going to. Students are going. To. Okay, so with LSTMs, we want to avoid this issue of fixing the context size, and we want to have so called arbitrary history. We basically want to go word by word and accumulate what we have learned about our history in vectors. So again, we start with a word to vec representation of this first word. Okay. And um, we are going to have recursive operations. So uh, here we are going to do our standard linear transformation. So I will call this E1 for embedding. So this is our standard thing. Take the uh, linear transformation and apply some uh, non-linearity, okay? And you see how I'm not closing the brackets because here I wanna do something extra and let's combine this representation with the representation of our history. Right now, our history is, uh, we don't have it because we have just started. Um, so here we are going to, um, this is the operation. Um, we are going to here, I don't know, plus H zero is gonna be zero vector. Okay, so think about this H zero being hidden representation of our history and our history right now doesn't exist and we just set this to be all zeros. 
more important point is that we are combining the representation of our inputs with this history. So here we have this operation. And then just to be consistent with the slides I've had before, there is this bias term, which I personally always pulled into the into the weights, but uh, I will add it here because I had it in these slides. So, um, and add a node can be folded into weights. Okay, so this is going to be hidden representation of the first word. And now we want to do our standard steps, which are to have the probability distribution over the next uh, token for the next token. So this is going to be softmax of uh, v0, vo, sorry, for output times uh, h1, as we had it before. This one is remember times v times our whatever is the dimension. Okay, great. So we did that. And then when we go to the next step, we just repeat that. We get E2. And then uh, H2 is going to be ReLU of linear transformation of the embedding of the second word times our history. And now our history is H1, which is um, a combination of the first word with the previous history, which was um, nothing plus bias. And then we do next steps. When we go to the third word, we are repeating this, right? Like we have H3, and this is where things become actually interesting. Relu of embedding of the third word plus the representation of the history plus bias. But now let's kind of trace back what the our history is. Okay. So here we are using the history, uh, previous history. Previous history is combination of the cur the word, the second word, and the previous history, which is H1 over here, which itself is the representation of the word one and the previous history. So you see how we are basically recursively uh, adding into the history, what was the history of the previous step, not only what was the previous word, but what everything else uh, appeared. Um, and as I said uh, last time, we are doing this, and in theory, this should by, you know, just adding these, uh, building this, uh, this vector of the history, everything should work smoothly, but there are many issues, practical issues, like the gradient becoming too small or too large, and training this uh, RNNs, although they are, in theory, sufficient for the purposes we want, they in practice aren't good enough. And this is why uh, transformers have appeared. Uh, another issue is, in terms of the practice, is that to calculate H3, you need the uh, H2 already calculated. So this can be done only by doing one thing at a time, and it's not good for parallelization, which is another issue for scaling. And what had actually made LLMs powerful is ability to scale them on ton of data in a large number of parameters, which these RNs at that form they, they had uh, in uh, 2018, 2017 were not powerful enough. Okay, so these are, uh, these are our neural uh, language models. Uh, and I mean, I think the point here for you in terms of feedforward neural networks is that it didn't change much. A few things have changed. And I think uh, one thing that's maybe conceptually hard to accept is that previously you classified into two classes, positive or negative. Now you are classifying in the you know number of classes is massive. It can be 30,000 uh, tokens because there are 30,000, excuse me, 30,000 classes because there are 30,000 tokens in the vocabulary. Uh, but in principle, mathematically, things haven't changed, right? Like we are still using the linear transformation, ReLU, another linear transformation into number of classes, apply softmax and get the probability distribution. So not much has uh, changed. And then next time, uh, soon we are gonna talk about transformer language models, which will be the language models uh, we are using. Okay, uh, just a brief uh, reminder, not a reminder, I kind of kept mentioning this, but let's let's introduce it more formally, this idea of teacher forcing. 
Um, so during training, we can, uh, for example, in these RNFs, as we progress, uh, we have an option. We can either use the whatever is the ground truth when we move to the next step, or we can use the token we have generated in the place of the previous yeah. one and then move to the next one. Um, when you use the ground truth, when you ignore what your model would actually generate as the next word, this is called teacher forcing, this idea that ground truth is teacher and you force the information from the ground truth. At the test time, you don't have an option because at the test time, you can't assume you know anything about your data. So in our events, as you progress to the next step, you must word, use the word you have actually generated as your previous word when you move to predicting the next word. So just visually, again, we start with the corpus, we sample some sentence, and then we start with some special beginning of sequence token, and we start creating words. At this position, uh, Sylvester Stallone, uh, in, our, in our training data, next word is has, but your model generate is. And when I say we are using teacher forcing, that means when we move on to generating next word, we are not going to use is in the input, we are going to use has. So instead of using what the model has generated as the next word, we are doing teacher forcing. We are forcing into the training what we have seen in the training data. The reason why we do this is because our language models, I think this idea of generating text out of nothing is really weird, right? Like, why would model generate anything if I start to give it beginning of sequence token? And it's gonna see lots of data, so it's gonna start with common things like, uh, I don't think a language model would ever start with an actual concrete uh, named entity unless this is the named entity that appears so much in the data. It's usually gonna be, Something like it is, you know, something that can appear in many contexts. Um, so yeah, this idea of just starting to generate out of nothing is is wild. And in your beginning, your language models are not going to generate coherent sequences. They're going to be terrible. So if you start using their own generations in the beginning, you are doomed because they're not going to be good, and it's not something that the model can learn from. Um, however, the issue is that at the test time, we, we are forbidden to look into what are actually the next word, because the whole point is to be able to predict the next word. So uh, in this case, we might have some discrepancy between what the model deems the next word is and what we are, um, you know, basically if the model always gets these nice words in the inputs during training, uh, and then at the test time, it starts to get, get uh, words it, it has uh, generated. It can create this what we call out of distribution situation where now things have shifted a little bit for the model. So to do that, to kind of prevent that, um, sorry, um, what people do during the training uh, is uh, schedule sampling where you first, um, start by teacher forcing. You are giving what is actual next word in the training data, but as the training process is progressing and the model start becomes a better language model and now its own generations are not complete rubbish, you are using some of it, the model's generations as the next uh, tokens to kind of prepare it for the test time where it's gonna just get its own predictions. Okay, so I think for me, it's important to have this idea of what we can do during training and how different it can be at the test time. During training, you have options to give uh, the models generations uh, of the next word or the actual word that had appeared as the next word in the corpus. During text time, all you can do is take whatever the model has generated. And then for the training, the best to do is mix and match. Start a little bit with you know, uh, aggressive teacher forcing and then uh, continue with adding models uh, generations. Okay, and now uh, final thing to say about uh, language models. Um, I mean, I guess not because we're gonna talk about large language models for many lectures. 
Um, but what I plan to say uh, last time is how do we evaluate language models? And um, what's also becoming important in this course is that you start to think about what is an appropriate evaluation for a given problem. Uh, we started with accuracy of F1 scores for classification. That's not the evaluation measure that you're going to be applying for every single task. So what we are going to use, for example, for language models is the likelihood of the test data. So we have built the language model on the training split of our corpus. And now we have a held out test portion. If our language model was good at modeling that data, the likelihood of our test held out data under that language model is going to be high because that model is generating, uh, you know, is a good model of the data. So to evaluate language models, Intrinsically, again, uh, remember that we had distinction between intrinsic and extrinsic evaluation. Here, intrinsic evaluation is, did we manage to get a good likelihood of our test data with this model? Because that was the whole point to build the this probability, uh, joint probabilities uh, of the sequences in the data. Extrinsic evaluation is when we actually do something with this now language model and test whether that improves the downstream um, performance. I started last lecture by giving you a bunch of examples where modeling probabilities of sequences can be beneficial, like spelling correction or uh, when you do transcribing, translation, and so on. This is where you want to check whether doing language modeling had actually um, you know, resulted in uh, downstream performances. So always remember the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic evaluations like we did uh, C with word embeddings as well. But in terms of the intrinsic evaluation, you will use a measure called perplexity, which is the function of the likelihood of our held out uh, data. Massively important measurement, although you will likely see it's only in uh, research uh, papers, but it is one of those, you know, holy grail measurements that everyone will uh, mention. What it does is basically uh, it calculates the um, sum operation of your likelihood of your data. So this probability uh, here is the joint probability of your corpus. Um, if you imagine your corpus being just a sequence of words, sequence of tokens, under your language model, you are capable of measuring the uh, likelihood of that data, right? That's what we were doing. We were measuring the probability distributions for the next word. And then when you multiply all of those, you get the joint probability of the sequence due to the chain rule. The only thing extra that perplexity is going to do is take the inverse. So higher likelihood means lower perplexity. So the goal is to have lower perplexity. And this inverse comes from the original definition of perplexity, which was done uh, in information theory, you probably heard about Shannon and things like that. So this is where the perplexity was introduced and it was done as the inverse. Here we are going to take the nth root and this is just to normalize uh, the likelihood by the length, by the number of tokens uh, in our corpus. And this is to avoid situation where likelihood gets smaller the longer the text is, because remember what the likelihood is, is a product of a bunch of conditional probabilities. Each probability is a number between zero and one. So when you multiply, keep multiplying, 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 the number will get smaller just by mathematical you know, uh, property of multiplying with the number smaller than one. Uh, so you want to avoid that. You don't want your likelihood to be small just because you have larger number of tokens. And this, um, if you take the nth root, that helps you with that. Okay, um, there isn't a great like ideal number with accuracy. The goal was 100% with F1 score, the goal was 100%. There is no perfect low number for perplexity. The lower is better. And you can compare two language models, but only if their vocabulary are shared. Uh, if they have different vocabularies, then you are measuring probability distribution over different things, and mathematically that doesn't make sense. But if you use the same uh, tokenizer and you have the same vocabulary, then you can um, measure the perplexity you get for your corpus that you get for a one language model and the perplexity that you get from another 
And if one has lower perplexity than the other, then um, you can say, well, that one is better language model on this data. And this is what people are doing today. When people are pre-training language models, when you read those papers, they're gonna say, well, our perplexity is better than this ones, which means that just as the pure language model, our language model is better. But then what people actually care about our extrinsic evaluation is that pre-trained language model actually better for many things people do, like anything you do with ChatGPT, for example. Okay. Um, yeah. Any questions about complexity? Yeah. So, uh, Yes, so you are right. We didn't talk about the actual uh, training. I will, I will come to that. Um, I mean, I should have already mentioned it. Uh, that's, a, that's a good reminder that I didn't do that. So when we are, let me maybe go to my... Okay, so just a moment, trying to find this one. Okay, so here, uh, going back to the RNNs, um, at, at each position, we have this probability distribution, and then we have uh, one next word that we know that appears, that's our like goal ground truth class for that example. And yes, you are right that at each position, then we can do negative log likelihood or cross entropy. So at each one of these positions over here, now this is very messy, but at each one of them, we are going to get some loss. Loss and here as well. And what we are gonna do is we are going to average these losses for this given uh, sequence, uh, for this given chunk of steps. So in the end, our loss is gonna be one over T, where T is the size, the number of tokens that we have generated, or yeah, times the loss of each one of them. So this will be loss one, two, uh, three. So you use this one to do the back propagation. Yeah. And we are going to talk about a little extension, but important extension of language modeling, which is conditional language model, where that's going to come in a moment. And then we'll have these losses more explicitly uh, written uh, as well. Yeah. Yeah, so this just comes from the fact that we don't want to do any labeling of the data and we are using the fact that we know what the next word is. So we know that whatever had actually appeared as the next word is a highly, should have high probability, right? Uh, but you're right that it's noisy in a sense that multiple words can do it. So when we move to the decoding strategy, we are going to move away from doing the, just the highest probable word as an expert. So we're doing, going to do various sampling uh, strategies. Yeah. Okay, so, all right. All right, so we are behind time, uh, but that's okay. I think it was important to go over some of these details to um, be on the same page. So now we know language models and um, we know neural language models. And um, I'm going to introduce the task of machine translation. And um, the reason why I'm going to introduce it is because we are going to, this is going to help us to, as I just said, have an example of so-called conditional language model, where you start with some uh, initial sequence in a case of machine translation, that's going to be a sentence in a given source language. And the goal is based on that sequence, conditionally generate what the translation is going to be, so another sequence. And in terms of our methodologies with these neural language models, it's going to very little is going to change. We're just going to need to encode this uh, source uh, sentence uh, somehow. Um, 
But this is going to be a nice segue into transformers. We are going to see, um, once we introduce conditional language model in one of the next lectures, we are going to see, well, it's going to be important to remember what the tokens in the source were. And we are going to introduce mechanism called attention to remember those words. And then we are going to see, well, that has limitations and we are going to introduce self-attention. And then that will be the main building block for the transformer architecture. And then we are going to cover the entire transformer architecture. Um, let me first introduce uh, now, uh, machine translation just as a, as a task, give you a little bit of what people have been thinking about before neural machine translation. And then we are going to switch into neural machine translation, which is basically going to be extension of the neural language modeling. We're going to see how we evaluate uh, machine translation. And then we are going to talk about these different decoding strategies. So move away from predicting the most probable token and look at this distribution and choose things like, let's look at the, the few probable ones and sample uh, from them uh, smartly. Okay, so uh, what is machine translation? First of all, it's one of these holy grail problems uh, in AI and one of these uh, oldest NLP tasks. So, you know, remember when I told you that in the fifties that uh, this aspiration to create human level intelligence in software and hardware had emerged. And this is how the term artificial intelligence was coined. At the time, the machine translation was one of those tasks which was associated with those abilities. And the, you know, what, what is it exactly? It's very easy. You get uh, some text in uh, some language which we call source language. For example, I will use Croatian because I, I speak it. Uh, and the goal is to generate translation of that text into so-called target language. So for example, here is a sentence, and the goal is to generate a sequence which says today we, are, we will learn about machine translation automatically with machines without human intervention. Uh, to do that, we are going to again use our supervised machine, trans um, excuse me, machine learning. And for that means we need uh, data. Uh, human author, human label data. Here we need a parallel corpus uh, with uh, sentences or texts and their translations. And these kinds of corpora where you have uh, a text and then another text associated with it and they are mirror of each other, they're called bitexts or parallel corpora. So an example of uh, some texts and their translation is an example of parallel corpus. Another piece of terminology is that human translations are called references and in text generation in general, human, whatever is human written will be referred to as, um, as a reference. So if you have a human author summer, summary, it's gonna be called reference summary um, uh, as another example of where this comes. And machine translation, will be called hypothesis uh, translation. Similarly, with any other generation, hypothesis summary would also be a uh, generated one. So yeah, terminology, source language, target language, by text or parallel corpus, reference and hypothesis translations. And to give you some sense of why this is not as trivial as my seem, I don't know if you feel like it, it is trivial, is uh, what kind of things professional translators need to do. They need to reword, reorder, rearrange words, replace single words with multiple word phrases and, and so on. So let's go over a few examples to see that. Uh, this is a Croatian sentence says, kako se osjećaš? Literal translation would be, how do you feel? Um, another translation that's possible would be, how are you doing in English? But if I back translate it in Croatian, it would mean kako ti radiš, which um, is hard to explain it if you if you don't speak Croatian. But we would never use it to to ask uh, the the question of how do you feel or how how how's it going, what's up, or any of those things. So um, this this uh, this phrase here literally in Croatian doesn't mean uh, the same thing, but you can uh, use it in English. Uh, then you have the things like uh, which you could literally translate in the same word by word. Yesterday, I bought a book. Um, reorder of translation would be, I bought a book yesterday. 
uh, which um, I guess it works, but um, it doesn't really work in uh, in Croatian. Or we have, uh, as I as I kind of hinted here, you want to replace single words with multiple word phrases. Uh, in Croatian, you can say "machina za praje suja," which in literal translation would be "machine for washing dishes," which we all know by dishwasher. Uh, but if you try to kind of have, do the literal back translation, it doesn't work in Croatian because we don't have one word for dishwasher. We have just this, you know, breakdown of uh, multiple words. So there are all these different things that had to be done by professional translators and also machine translation systems. Uh, and this is what makes this task not so simple. A conceptual framework that was used for the uh, machine translation um, was using this pyramid scheme where you can have basically different, um, how to say, um, lack or at the lowest level, there is a lack of any intermediate uh, representation of your source text. You're just trying to maybe word by word translate uh, something. So you go directly from string to string. Uh, but how people have also been thinking about this is what we, if we have some very good representation of syntax or grammar in the source language, and then we impose that uh, whatever translation we do in the uh, in the whatever translation is is uh, emerges from the system or a human should uh, kind of follow that uh, syntax. Uh, so you find some kind of um, grammar intermediate representation that helps that the the syntax of source and target uh, sequences are well aligned. And similarly with semantics, you want to maybe to have some kind of uh, representation of meaning where if you make a translation that representation of meaning shouldn't be violated. For example, if you have logic, which I have already mentioned is insufficient for uh, natural language, but for a moment, imagine you have just the logical rules. Um, then you want your target, uh, your translation, to not violate those logical rules that uh, you know are uh, produced in your source language. And interlingua is this more like very abstract way of thinking about all of this. Is if you can have a representation where syntax, semantics, all of that is already kind of captured by that by that. Um, uh, representation of language, and then you impose a similar thing that um, nothing is uh, violated when you uh, translate. Um, very important things that people have been thinking about between uh, before neural language models are these uh, word alignments, where you, you say, okay, I'm gonna kind of embrace this uh, viewpoint where I just try to directly translate from text to text without building any kind of you know, representations of either syntax or meaning. I'm not gonna use any kind of dependency trees or logical rules. I'm just trying to translate from text to text. And this could be done by translating word by word, right? So here, you translate into yesterday I bought a book. You can um, translate it uh, word uh, by word. Although you notice that, for example, here, some copula is gonna be linked uh, with uh, to the same word. So it's not exactly one-to-one -one mapping. It can go from two to one. And also see how the word I, we in Croatian can omit the pronoun and not specify it because our morphology is richer. So just by through the through the verb can signal what the pronoun is. So here no word is linked to, to I. And it can get a little bit tricky if you switch the order. So you see how here now there is a lot of overlapping um, arrows uh, because Yuchar um, um, knigu, totally valid a way of saying it in Croatian is translated into something where uh, now this word comes only at the at, as the final word uh, in a sequence. So it's not like oh, first word in my source language is going to be first word in my target language. It doesn't need to work uh, like that. And uh, already this situation here hints on uh, something which will be known as phrase uh, alignment, uh, which I'll come into second. I'm not going to teach you any of the details of how to build word alignment models. The goal here is to just give you an impression of what people have been thinking about when they did machine translation before neural approaches. 
but in this uh, so in this um, word alignment um, view, uh, people were trying to find basically these alignments. The goal is to, was to find a machine learning model that can predict you which word should be aligned to which word in the target language. Uh, so you are going to model the joint probability of the alignment and the translation. And uh, one algorithm that was famously uh, done for that is called expectation maximization EM uh, algorithm, which today we don't uh, teach, I think, even in a machine learning course. And as always with machine learning, you make different assumptions, which might not be true in the uh, actual translation. Um, quickly, the word alignment models were then extended to phrase alignment uh, because uh, as you might already kind of have a sense from these examples, real translations are not word to word substitution. So um, for example, uh, many multi-word expressions are not translated literally. In Croatian, ida monakavu would mean in English, we go to the coffee, which doesn't really make sense. Uh, you would say we'll have uh, we'll have a coffee. So trying to find this phrase uh, phrase uh, alignments. Um, however, the reason why I'm kind of going through this and not giving you many details is because in 2014, um, this has been totally replaced by neural machine translation. It has. It was one of those big seminal moments uh, in NLP. If you are more in computer vision and you know what Alex Knight was for computer vision, that's basically what neural machine translation was for uh, NLP. And later we have many of these uh, situations as, as you can imagine with ChatGPT. So since 2014, this field has been pretty intensive in terms of you know constantly massive things are happening. Um, so yeah, neural machine translation came into, into the play, I will, before I do this, um, before, like maybe you got the sense with these word alignments, okay, you are doing kind of making these assumptions and taking a certain view of what translation is, then you are trying to, you have your parallel corpus and you're trying to estimate these uh, probabilities of alignments and it's very complex and you need, um, at the time word embeddings were in a thing, so you also you had to have, uh, manual feature engineering of what each word should be represented. And that all has been replaced with neural machine translation where everything is done without any human intervention beyond providing parallel corpus. Um, so here you are going to see a visualization of um, so-called encoder decoder RNN. Um, this part over here is what I have showed you today when we were talking about RNNs, where you get the word, you do some computation, you get the next word, you move to the next word. The only thing that's going to change here is now that you have the something to condition everything with. And here with machine translation, you are conditioning your generation with whatever is your source uh, sequence. Uh, this is a sentence I, I believe in uh, French. So this is how it goes. So first word goes into encoder. There is some hidden representation. And you see how hidden representation is combined with, you know, there are always two arrows coming in. Let me let this finish and I will do it again. Okay, so um, it's too fast. Um, when, when you're looking at the encoding stage, Pay attention into how a word goes into the computation, and then there is a hidden representation out of it. That's exactly what I was showing you today, where we have, um, whenever we are computing the representation, the hidden representation at the current time point, we are combining it with the history. That's how I called it, hidden representation of a history together with the word embedding. So when you see two arrows coming into the encoder RNN, there, that's that's what uh, this visualization is showing. At some point, that will be final. We are going to be done with the hidden uh, representation of our source sequence. That goes into the decoder. And now everything here is basically neural language modeling. Remember how previously I, I showed you the hidden vector is all zeros when we start? Here, it's not going to be all zeros. Rather, it's going to be that whatever is the final hidden representation of this sequence. So again, it's a little bit fast, but 
try to try to see how the, we always have these two arrows and then the final hidden state goes into decoder rnn and then the generation is starting which is basically a uh, language modeling so everything has been combined it goes into decoder and then outputs one word uh, at a time Okay, a little bit more concrete and less abstract, uh, the same thing that we have just seen uh, uh, with more detail. So we have two, uh, neuro two parts of the same neural network. So everything here is connected, it's everything is joined, uh, but the way you can think about this as if you have two RNNs. They're not really two, they are, two, you know, they are connected. Uh, but two, just because this one is encoding the source uh, sequence, and this one is going to decode the target sequence. Or in other words, for machine translation specifically, this RNN is going to encode the source sentence in a source language, and this one is going to decode it into the target language. So here we have a some sort of uh, source sentence um, I believe this is French, not 100% sure. And uh, what we are doing here is just doing those operations uh, as we have seen before. Here, you're not interested into decoding anything. So there is no concept of the output layer here. All you are doing is you produce the hidden representation at the time step one, then you move to the next one and next one and next one. You're just building the hidden representations of your source tokens. And then whatever is the final uh, representation, uh, excuse me, whatever is the hidden representation at the final token in your source, that goes into the decoder. And now decoder is just a language model that generates the sentence in a target language. Uh, it seems like the target sequence is he hit me with the pie. I don't know why. And this example is um, so weird <laughs> and uh, violent, but, uh, that's the translation of this source sentence. So here, you literally have your language model, the way I have demonstrated at the beginning of this class, except that the initial hidden representation is actually the hidden representation that's computed at the last token of your source sequence, and in theory, should represent the entire source sequence. So everything else uh, stays the same. You start with some special token, like a star token, and then given the hidden representation of a source sequence and given the embedding of your star token, you generate the next word. See here they're using 3D decoding, using the uh, predicting the highest probable token as the next token. They're not using teacher forcing because he is then input uh, to, in, is the next next word uh, that um, appears in the input, and then you repeat the computations. Um, let me just see whether I missed anything here. Okay, so one thing that I'm promised I will say is how do we train this? So, as as I as I said, we have parallel corpus of source and target sen sentences and we encode our source sentence, we decode our target sentence, but at each one of these positions, we know what should have been uh, generated. So uh, uh, here we know that the word he should be the word that's being uh, generated, that should be generated. And if it's not, we are going to have our standard cross entropy neg neg negative log likelihood training to them to say to the model that this is not the correct. Uh, prediction. So each one of these J's is a negative log likelihood given what the true uh, word uh, sh uh, is in our translation. And you are going to take the average of those losses to be your final loss, the one which will be used to back propagate into this way such that in the next iteration, the translation capabilities of this model are uh, better. Okay, so this is uh, optimized as a single si system. Although we call this encoder RNN and this is called decoder RNN, they are a single RNN, a single system. And 
this whole operation op operates back uh, end to end without human intervention. This was approach sequence to sequence was uh, introduced in uh, Sutskever et al. 2014. Ilya Sutskever might uh, ring a bell in your mind, one of the uh, important people in OpenAI that has left uh, this year. Since then, of course, won a, t a test of time award at uh, Neurips. And if this is just an approach that produces a sequence given an another sequence. It is an example of conditional text generation. It's originally approached with encoder-decoder architecture. Uh, this encoder takes a variable length sentence and produces a vector that represents this entire sequence. Uh, into uh, it, it represent, represents a vector that represents this whole uh, sequence, but the vector is always going to be of a fixed size. And decoder is just a conditional language model. And originally, these were RNNs, but uh, as I promised, we are going to move on into sequence to sequence approaches uh, with uh, transformers. Okay, so this brings me to the end of machine translation, neural machine translation. And then we are going to talk about how to evaluate something like this and how to play around with these uh, decoding strategies. Uh, next. Okay, thank you.